Let us encounter you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning. in the valley, praise on the mountain, I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting, I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded, cause praise is the water, my enemies drown. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'll praise when I feel it, praise when I don't. still in control His praise is a weapon It's more than a sound My praise is a shout Brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing See 
who mourn would be comforted, that he would provide, that he would be there with healing and, and blessing. And I, I think of so many things. God, you are so good. God, you're so good. Come on, just tell him he's good in this place. He's so good to us. He's holy. Lord, we're thankful for you.
let's just sit for a minute. And in these moments, this is, this is where we get to encounter the living God. This is where we get to put aside all the craziness of everything going on around us and just put our hands out in front of us and say, Lord, you're good. God, thank you. Like having, just saying thank you for the provision. Thank you for the help. Thank you for the protection. Just putting it back on him because he's the one that's bringing it. So let's, let's just sit here for a second. God, thank you. Come on, with, with your words, with your mouth, just with your thoughts. Lord, thank you for your provision. God, thank you for running after us. Thank you for your goodness chasing us. God is always running after us, no matter where we go. for you. God, we're thankful for you. God, in everything that we're doing, everywhere we're going, Lord, you're right there with us, chasing us down. God, your mercy and your goodness follow us for all of our days. God, yes, yesterday held things that we may have fallen or, or we didn't honor you or whatever's going on, but right now we get to encounter you in this moment. us see it. Open our eyes. Open our hearts, God, to see your goodness. God, we're thankful for you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Man, let's give it up for the Lord. He's so good to us. Well, if you could, before you're seated, turn to somebody around you, shake their hand, give them a high five, introduce yourself.
Well, hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing this morning? All right. Hey, praise the Lord. Energy. I love it. Thank you, Jesus. You know, it's like, okay, we've got a little yee-yee out there, too. All right, whatever that means. Uh, not up with the lingo, you know what I mean? Um, I, every now and then I try to say a millennial or Gen X word, and they're like, stop. You know, so uh, it is what it is. Well, hey, I'm glad you're here this morning. A little gloomy outside, a little foggy, but hey, you're in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. So good to see you guys. Just want to mention a quick word about Easter. Um, we have added that third service on Saturday night at 6 p.m. Okay, now, I know a, a, we, had, we did that little survey, and a lot of people were like, it's okay if we're packed in, you know, just, well, I hear you. That's great. That's fine. We're going to still have 9 and 11. But let me kind of explain what the 6 o'clock on Saturday night service is all about. It is, I don't know if you remember back in the day when MTV actually played music um, instead of dumb shows. They, um, well, dumb music too, but anyway. Um, they, um, they used to have this thing called Unplugged. And it was basically you take like a band like Pearl Jam and they come and they play this Unplugged set and it's all acoustic. It's just stripped back. There's not the fancy show and all that lights and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of the focus of what that Saturday night service is going to be about. Um, we, the only child care that we'll have, only, you know, kid men that we're going to have is nursery. So if you come, your kids will be in with you, um, in the sanctuary. It'll be acoustic worship. We'll do the message. It's just going to be, let's just focus on Jesus and on the Lord and that. There won't be the, the hype and fanfare that you might normally see, um, on a Sunday morning. Not that hype and fanfare is bad. Okay, it's not. It's fun when you come to a church that's exciting and welcoming and the coffee bar is rocking and rolling. You got donuts flying around everywhere and, you know, all that stuff. Um, it, you know, it's 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 just a, a, a part of helping people feel comfortable and excited about church and all that kind of stuff. Um, but Saturday night, we're just creating a space for people where if they want to come and just like get with the Lord. Um, and I know there are a lot of you that are going to want to do both. I hear you, fam. Hey, you do what you want to do. But we're going to offer this and we're going to. Um, basically rep it on social media a lot um, because I know there are a lot of people out there that would for one thing I know there are a lot of people out there that want to come check Freedom Church out but they work on Sundays so they do different things like that and so um, our thought process is not only do we give people another opportunity to come and worship on that Easter weekend but I don't know that anybody's ever tried a Saturday night service in the area and the only way you can tell if a Saturday night service works is if you try it so um even if it's just me and Tony and some chickens, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I'm, I'm excited about it because I know as far as our staff goes, um, Easter is like the Super Bowl at church, you know what I'm saying? And so our staff is like in high gear and all that kind of stuff. Our volunteer teams are. And so um, I know Tony and I both, as we were talking about it and kind of deciding, should we do this or not? Um, just the idea of having a, a just a stripped back, unplugged moment. Um, we're kind of excited about that. So... Um, but be inviting your friends and family for Easter Sunday. Um, look, we, we could care less about being packed out because of numbers, and we can go, ooh, look at what we had. Uh, we want to see heaven populated, y'all, and we want to see what God's doing in your heart and life and other people as well. And so even when we went to two services uh, you know, a couple of years back, we, we had the conversation of, oh, we don't want to lose the family feel. We're not losing the family feel. We're just opening the doors, making the house bigger so that more family can come be a part. And so um, the best way to make people feel like they're a part of the family is for you to make them feel like they're a part of the family. Um, it's not on staff and leadership. It's, uh, it's all on us working together to see the kingdom uh, move in people's hearts and lives. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Quick building update is just this. We're getting bids. Um, things are coming in. We're deciding whether or not we go with one specific contract and let them do everything. Not a contractor, but one company and let them do everything. Or do we piecemeal it together? We got a bid back on a building the other day that we're going to be talking about um, this week. And so just wanted, I want you to know that things are moving. We're getting stuff done. And um, so if you have any questions, y'all come talk to me individually about that. But I do want to let you know, you know, last week uh, we talked about... Um, we talked about kind of a push uh, towards giving towards the facility. We think it's going to take about $250,000 to get us in it, like op actually op operating in it or whatever. And um, just last week, we either had given or pledged, y'all hear me, $170,000. Wow. All right? That's wild, wild stuff. That is miraculous, okay? Um, even even guys that I talked to who, who are in the the business, I hate to say it like that, but there's the business side of it, but in the business of helping churches raise funds, they're like, that just doesn't happen normally, okay? This is a miraculous thing that y'all got going on over here, 
And so, um, we, um, so we're working towards that number. Praise the Lord. It ain't us. It's just Jesus. And, um, and every single person that has given or has pledged, every single one of them, they don't want a name on a building. They don't want anybody to know. They just want to be obedient to the Lord. And I'm telling you, that is the true heart of a kingdom giver right there. Is it's all about Jesus and the kingdom moving forward. And that's what we're after. That's all we're after, guys. So just want to let you know kind of that's where we are. And we're, uh, we're continuing to move along. Um, I'm so happy you're here this morning um, because we are diving into a brand new uh, series for the month of March leading up to Easter Sunday on March 31st. Um, and this series, it's, it's called Five Moments, okay? Um, I believe the Easter message is going to challenge you. Um, I've already begun the process of writing it. I know exactly what, what I need to do on it, and God's already shown me kind of the, the outline. And um, I, I mean, I just, it's already challenging me. So if it's challenging me, I mean, it's going to challenge you as well. And I think it's going to move you to a deeper walk with Jesus, into trusting him more, into believing more fervently in his faithfulness. I think you're going to grasp who he is more. And I think it's also going to challenge you to step into the life that God's called you to live. Because whatever you're doing right now for Jesus, okay, you can do more. All right. And I know some of you are thinking like, well, I'm not in vocational ministry and God's not called me to vocational ministry. That's awesome. That's great. Can I tell you something? You can a lot of times do more in non vocational ministry than you can in vocational ministry. Uh, you know, anytime uh, one of the reasons why I don't like being called pastor is because anytime I'm out in the public and somebody hears the word pastor, they automatically like, oh, OK, <sighs> I'm sorry, for, you know, like they're like, get all they, they watch what they say. They, they, they change their personality because they're afraid that I'm going to judge them. Now, number one, how how terrible is that, that the natural reaction of somebody when they hear the word pastor is I'm about to get judged. Yeah. Uh, come on, church, we got to do better than that, y'all, don't we? We got to do better. Uh, but but we want to see people's lives changed and people's lives moved. And, and just the staff at church can't be responsible for all that. The, the, the Bible tells us that we're to go and make disciples, not the preachers and the pastors or the worship guy or the kids men director. No, we are all supposed to be making disciples. And I'm also not saying that you got to walk around and just throwing tracks at people and making people feel uncomfortable. And, you know, if that's you, knock yourself out. I got a friend that he loves to tell people, do you know my Jesus? All right, love it. That's his shtick. And, and, and people respond positively to that. Not everybody can do that. But here's what I want to get us to. is a place where our life is screaming evangelism, not just our mouth. I want people to look at our lives and say, wow, I want to know what you have that's so different. That's the kind of thing that I think we need to be doing. But leading up to Easter and to that moment of resurrection, there's specific moments in the life of Jesus that changed everything. And, and it wasn't just for the people of the time who actually witnessed these things firsthand, but it's for you and I as well. And so over the course of the next few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to highlight four moments that changed everything, that changed us, culminating in that fifth moment, the resurrection uh, that we see change the world. So we're going to highlight a few things. We're going to highlight the Sermon on the Mount, which I'm going to tell you right now, like volumes have been written about the Sermon on the Mount. And so for me to try to pack it into a 45-minute message, I'll be praying for you, for, for your boy here, because like it's, a, it's a lot in the Sermon on the Mount. But we're going to talk about the transfiguration. We're going to talk about Jesus' miracles and specifically Lazarus being raised from the dead. And we're going to talk about um, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on Easter Sunday. But today I want to talk about his baptism. That's the focus today is his baptism. Now, I want you to understand two things from the jump. First, we have the baptism ready to go if you feel like God is directing you towards this by the end of this message. Okay? Well, I don't know I'm going to get my clothes wet. That's okay. We'll just wrap a towel around you. You know what I'm saying? But second, if you've already been baptized and you've been living for Jesus, and you're like, oh, well, this is a message I can check out in because I've already kind of checked this thing off. I want you to stop that right now and don't check out. Pay attention because I really believe there's more to baptism than being dunked in the water. Okay? So if you uh, have the version app, jump on that, follow along. There's a lot of verses we're going to hit today. And uh, I want you to be sure to, to grab on that. But we're going we're gonna, to um, start today reading out of Matthew chapter 3. And, you know, as I began to pray about this series, um, I felt the Lord really direct me to these five moments specifically and. When I was thinking about baptism, some questions came up about baptism and why, why Jesus was baptized. 
Anybody ever wonder that? Like, why did Jesus get baptized? Okay, maybe just me. We've read the story probably, but let's read it together today, starting in Matthew 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. What, what a moment. Like, okay, you can imagine being there, and like Jesus is baptized, and all of a sudden the heavens open, a dove flies down, and then you hear this voice booming from the heavens, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. When I got baptized, all I heard was, here's a towel. Yeah, yeah. Look, at Freedom, we believe that there is a purpose for baptism that goes beyond an outward sign of an inward change, which is the common language that we hear when it comes, well, you just need to follow Jesus' example and be baptized. Okay, I hear you. But we believe it's exponentially more than just getting wet in a water tank, okay? When you're baptized, it's more than just following his example. You're saying yes to Jesus. You're making him Lord. And the Bible teaches that your old nature is crucified with Christ. As you're crucified with Christ, your old nature dies. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, the old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's one of the reasons why we recite that verse all the time when we do baptisms here. You're literally a new creation in Christ Jesus. Brand spanking new. Okay? But something has to be done with the old nature that was crucified on the cross with Jesus. And that old nature is buried in baptism. And as you come out of the water, the old nature stays in that watery grave, never to have any further impact on your life. And just remember, as that old nature is buried in baptism, all of those cords that were tied to who you were are severed in that moment. And the only life that that old nature has going forward is the life that you resurrect in it. So when you go back to the, to the vomit like the dog does, you are resurrecting that. Maybe you've done that in your life. Maybe you've crucified the old nature, you've been baptized, you cut all that stuff away. But you've dabbled in it again and that thing has been resurrected. Listen to me, it can die again. Okay? Well, that means I've got to get baptized again. That's between, that's between you and Jesus. That's between you and Him. You might need to. You might need to. But I know there are times in my life, I've been baptized before, multiple times. I've been baptized two that I can remember. Okay? And, and I didn't like, start, okay, God, Jesus, I've got to start all back at zero with you. All right, well, um, hello, Jesus, I'm back at, at step one. That's not how it works. The Bible says if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And don't forget that when Jesus died for sin, he didn't just die for the sin that you did commit. It's for the sin that you will commit too. For the totality of sin. The Bible teaches this. The old nature is buried in baptism. And as you come out of the water, you are brand new. The old nature stays. You're brand new. Now, we believe this is the biblical uh, uh, explanation of the sacrament of baptism. It's more than just something you do. It's a spiritual transaction that takes place. Baptism does not save you. Everybody hear me very clearly. Baptism does not save you. But it's the cutting away of that old nature so that you can be raised. Think resurrected into new life. This is what the Bible teaches. Well, I don't know, preacher. I've never heard it like that. Okay, Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with them by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. There it is. There it is in black and white. Jesus was raised. He wants us to be raised too. Which, by the way, is why I think there's a song out there right now. The cross has the final word. Anybody heard that song? I think that song is theologically inaccurate. Because the resurrection is what had the final word. If Jesus died on the cross and stayed dead, there would be no new life resurrected in Jesus Christ. The penalty for sin might have been paid, but now what? We're still dead in our trespass. We need something to raise us to life. That's why the resurrection is everything. Now, since this is what the Bible teaches, then my first question was simply this. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Follow the train of thought. We bury our old nature, our old sinful, yucky self that died on the cross with Jesus. Wait a minute, I thought Jesus was perfect. Why would he need to go 
to baptism. After all, he's perfect, right? That in and of itself, by the way, was a miracle. Okay, think about this. He never talked back to Mary when she said, Jesus, we take out the trash. Like, come on, like this right here, ready? That disqualifies him. So whenever you think that your kids are perfect or whatever, and they talk back at you, just remember to yourself, they ain't Jesus. (laughs) Never an evil thought or word or deed. Even when he looked across the court, the courtyard, and he saw Peter had betrayed him. Not even then. Never a moment of weakness when he faltered. Do y'all think um, girls never threw themselves at Jesus? Never a moment of, never a tired, exhausted moment where his mind got away with him. It's a miracle. The Bible doesn't talk much about Jesus' childhood, but the few glimpses we do get to see, they reveal a young Jesus who was very aware of his purpose. Think about when Jesus was 12 at the temple. Mary's like, boy, where you been? He says, don't you know I'd be about my father's business? Joseph's business was carpentry. His father's business was the restoration of mankind. 2 Corinthians 5.21, listen to this verse. This, boy, this verse is, mm, this is a lot. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Leave it on the screen for just a minute, because you really need to take this in. I always thought that the crucifixion made Jesus... Sweat, drops of blood, anxiety and stress because of the pain. It it wasn't the physical pain. It was that the thing that God loved the most in a moment would become the thing God hated the most. And so your sin, my sin put him on the cross. No, he became your sin. This isn't a matter of him just bearing it on his back for a minute. He became the very evil that you've put your hands to. And guess what else, church? The very evil that has been done to you, he became that too. That's why it blows my mind to think that in the middle of a moment where either you've been sinning or someone has been sinning against you, we always wonder, well, where was Jesus in that moment? And in that moment, Jesus became the sin because he knew if he became the sin, he could bring you to righteousness through him. Like, I think we're missing the big picture about what he's done. So the, the stupid sin that you're going to do this week for the hundredth time, Jesus didn't just die for that. He became it so that you could be righteous. So the sin that you did yesterday that had you stressing out this morning at worship, and you didn't know if you could raise your hands because you were thinking about what you did yesterday. Jesus already not only paid the price for that, but he became it so that you could become righteous. It's, it's mind-boggling. This is what Jesus did for us. But if he was sinless, as the Bible here clearly says, why did he need to be baptized? The question immediately popped in my head before the Holy Spirit could answer the first question. I was already thinking of another question. That other question was, well, where did baptism come from anyway? Have you ever thought about that? Until John, they weren't like Duncan folks, you know what I'm saying? Like, and even then, there's like the, some churches that sprinkle and some that don't. You know what I'm saying? Like, we kind of mess with people when we're here. We're like, we're going to hold you under for however long you were sinning. They're like, oh, what? You know, like, it's a joke. We're not going to do that, okay? It's a dunk immersion. And then it's like, we, okay, like, do you fully immerse? Is sprinkling okay? Like, there's all these different things. But where did it even come from? Well, we, were, we really don't see baptism in the Old Testament like we do now or in Jewish traditions, really. And there are, there are three groups of, of Jewish leaders. I don't know if you knew this. I know you know the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Does anybody know the difference? It's kind of hard to know the difference sometimes. It's a really easy way to remember it. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection. So that's fair, you see. And the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. That's sad, you see. Super easy way to remember them. All right. Praise God for Bible college. Or a little lady at a little Baptist church somewhere with a felt board. Sad, you see? You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe you got it there. But there was a third group that a lot of times people don't talk about, the Essenes. And you may have heard of them before because 
of this thing called these things called the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran. You ever heard of those Dead Sea Scrolls? Kind of a big find. So Josephus wrote a lot about them. And he basically said that it was a group of scholars and they lived like hermits out in, in, in the desert, in these hills and in these caves. Kind of like kind of like John, you know, wandering in the wilderness with his little goat hair, camel hair shirt on and all that stuff, eating locusts. But here's what, here's what Josephus says. They rise early and bathe frequently in the water to purify themselves. Okay, now oh, that's interesting. Now, I'm one of those guys that likes to take a shower in the morning and in the nighttime because I don't like being stinky. Anybody else? Come on. Like, so, but was it just for cleanliness? But it's, he says to purify. Now, that's an interesting word. Some scholars even believe that the Essenes are the ones that influence John and his theology when it comes to baptism. Okay. Now, regardless of the Essenes and their potential influence, God has used water across generations as a metaphor and sometimes an actual tangible tool for miracles to indicate purification, the purification process, etc. Let me give you some examples. The flood purified the earth of sin because guess what? It wasn't about elephants and lions, kids' ministry. It was about the slaughter of humanity, all right? That's what Noah's Ark was about. Elephants are cuter, though. And you can't put slaughter of humanity on the walls in BKs. You know what I'm saying? What about Naaman? Whose leprosy was cleansed by bathing seven times in the Jordan. In fact, Naaman got mad about it. How come the Jordan, a dull, muddy river? And his servant's like, if he'd have told you to go bathe somewhere else, you'd have done it. Just go do what he said to do. And he was cleansed. The Bible says that his skin looked like that of a baby. So come on over and above, press down, shaking together. You think God won't do over and above what you expect him to do? What about Moses in the Nile? That was salvation, basically. What about parting the Red Sea? Not only did Israelites get through the Red Sea into the promised land, but it annihilated the very thing that was chasing them. Does anybody in here need to go through some water so that that God can annihilate the thing that's been chasing you? Okay, well, let me tell you what. If you want the victory of the Egyptians being annihilated so you can get free, you've got to deal with the terror of standing between a rock and a hard place, a body of water and an army ready to kill you, and then having to trust the Lord to get you through. Some of y'all are scared to death because you know it's going to take a miracle. Don't look at the water. Look at Jesus. What about Aaron and the high priest being purified? Water stories show us how God uses water to do these great things. And while water is used to heal people and provide a way of escape and to purify, water was also used to destroy the enemies of God, to remove evil from the earth, and to eliminate those who chase God's people to destroy them. Water stories do more than just encourage us that God protects, rescues, and purifies but also that he uses water to drown that evil in us that seeks to destroy us, much like we do in baptism as we bury our old nature. Now, these are incredible stories, water stories, but it doesn't really answer the question about where baptism came from and why. One of these I mentioned helps, though. Uh, The one about Aaron and the priest being purified. There's something maybe you've not heard of in the temple complex called the Brazen Sea. And what happens in this situation is you have you have the altar, which is a square made of bronze that has four horns on it. That's where the sacrifices were performed. And in between that and the temple, you have the brazen sea, which is basically a basin with water in it. And then you have the temple, which has the holy place, which has the showbread, the candlesticks. And then you go into the Holy of Holies, which has the Ark of the Covenant. But look at what happens with this brazen sea. Listen to Exodus 30, verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, You shall make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet, so that they may not die. He says it again. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him, to his offspring, throughout their generations. Okay, so two times God says, if they don't wash, death. So there's the answer to why Jesus got baptized. Jesus was being purified for sacrifice. 
this was exponentially more than just a ritual that John needed to perform. John was preparing the way and Jesus was walking in it. Now, I read before from Matthew 3 where Jesus was baptized, but let's look back at the verse in Matthew 3 leading up to the moment where Jesus was baptized, starting in verse 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. When Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, uh, then uh, uh, they were, and then they were baptized, they were being baptized with him in the river, Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Boy, John is... The, this, was a, this was like the religious leaders. That'd be like having a delegation of all the evangelical pastors in the United States and you all be like, y'all going to get cut down and thrown into the fire. Like, this is crazy talk. And they could kill him over it. I baptize you with water for repentance, he says, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Wow. So what John was doing was exponentially different from the religious life that Israel had been following. Okay, John was doing way more than simply baptizing people in the countryside. He was preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Now, the verse says prepare the way, but look at the passage from Isaiah that John was referencing, starting in uh, chapter 40, verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let me just tell you real quickly that some of this not necessarily in our notes today. But when Jesus is talking, when God is talking here about the, the hills being leveled and the valleys being raised, what it means is God is removing every hindrance that's keeping you from experiencing him. And I'm going to tell you right now, if we were still having to follow the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, none of us would be doing it. You would have to come every Sunday morning, you have to bring a heifer and sacrifice it. And some turtle doves. Like, where are you going to get a turtle dove from? Do they even have those still? John was called to prepare the way for the Messiah, for the Lord. And beyond preaching repentance and the kingdom being at hand, baptism was a part of it. So when John baptized Jesus, it was more than a dunk in the Jordan. What was it? It was Jesus was being purified to become our high priest and offer a sacrifice once and for all. Can you see why this is such a big moment now? Hebrews 9 describes the temple set up, the outer court, the brazen sea and altar, the holy place with the lampstand and showbread, the holy of holies, the ark of the covenant. The priests would wash and perform the sacrifice. I told you this just a second ago, but it's a lengthy passage that we're about to read here. But I need you to see the depths of this. And this is coming out of Hebrews, starting in chapter 9. It says this, starting in verse 6. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people they'd committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies. Physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. 
He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not a part of this created world. Listen, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true heaven. He entered into it to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Wow. Jesus' baptism was to prepare himself To offer the sacrifice so that you could be saved. And he invites you to be baptized as well. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38. Peter was just on a, boy, he was on a rant to these people in Jerusalem. And he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 22, 16 says, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. If you haven't been baptized, what are you waiting for? Now, I had a conversation with somebody a couple weeks back, and they said that they were going to wait. They wanted to wait six months, because that's when the end of D groups was. I love it. Now, that's the only time I say, let's wait on the Lord on this one. Because more than anything, he wants to be sure that God cleans out all of that mess so when he goes in that watery grave it's all in there i love that but if god's been speaking to you about being baptized y'all it ain't the devil i think you should get baptized (laughs) no it's it's not how that works baptism baptism doesn't save you only jesus can do that But baptism is something that Jesus did, and it's something he wants you to do. And one last thing on this before we move on. Of all the moments Jesus had on earth, why this one? Why is this one of the five? Here's why. I want you to see baptism beyond the scope of a post-salvation one-time event, but that baptism is purification as much as it is the burying of the old nature. This was a big event even for Jesus. It was a ceremonial washing to prepare for sacrifice. And remember, John protested. He said, wait, wait, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said in Matthew 3.15, let it be so now, thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Fulfill what righteousness? Simple. Purification for sacrifice. Now, for all those who have listened up to this point, hopefully you realize that Jesus' baptism was a big deal because it purified him to serve as our high priest. But what does all this mean for you? I I encourage you in this moment that if you haven't been baptized, but you confess Jesus as Lord, I encourage you to get baptized. We got water here today. We can do that if you want to. But maybe you were baptized before and you believe God is calling you to it again, along with a fresh commitment. Again, that ain't the devil telling you to do that. But beyond a next step after salvation, I need you to see the power of baptism in terms of purification. But for what? For Jesus, it was to prepare him to serve as a sacrifice for you. But what about for you? Here's what it is for you. We're purified for relationship and service. 
it might have been a long time since you were baptized, but how long has it been since you were purified? We often miss out on God's best through lack of daily confession. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean a few things. Um, we confess Jesus as Lord at some point in our lives. Okay, that's how you're saved. We, we are filled with the Holy Spirit at some point in our lives. We're baptized at some point in our lives. Okay? We actually argue about some of these moments, though, in church. It's really funny. Like, what are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, some say when you get saved. Some say, well, you get a deposit of the Holy Spirit, and then in a second experience, you get the fulfillment of that deposit. Um, people argue about once saved, always saved. When you confess Jesus as the Lord. Look, I'm going to tell you right now. Daily confession fixes all this. I could care less when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So we hear arguing about when. Well, it's that salvation. Well, just ask Him to fill you now. Like, like everybody, let's just do it. Holy Spirit, fill me. So why are we going to argue about when it happens? The daily confession fixes this. Okay? Rather than worry about when we're filled or if we're saved, just confess Him as Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to fill us on the daily. In fact, why do we see these events as moments in our past rather than a daily confession? Every morning we need to be confessing Jesus as Lord. Every morning we need to be asking the Holy Spirit to fill us up. And every morning we need to follow Jesus' example in baptism. Now, I don't mean go down to Potez and get a water trough like us. And every morning like, oh, I'm going to be late to work. You know, like. <laughs> but, but what if we. What if we experienced and engaged in daily baptisms for purification's purposes? What if every day we were baptized for the purpose of purity? What, what's that even mean? Well, first I want you to look at the idea of continually in the Bible. Psalm 105.4, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face continually. Psalm 34.1, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Psalm 71.14, but as for me, I will hope continually and I will praise you yet more and more. Psalm 16.8, I've set the Lord continually before me because he's at my right hand. I'll not be shaken. Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. How do you get continually in your life? I'm so glad you asked. I put it on the screen for you. Here's the next slide. Good morning, Jesus. I confess you as Lord today. You are all that I need and I trust in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit fresh and anew. Lead me and guide me, Holy Spirit. Help me produce your fruit today. Search my heart today, Lord. Purify me and wash me clean. I'm yours, Jesus. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It ain't got to be that. We don't have to. It's not about necessarily praying the Lord's Prayer. Oh, I'll follow who often heaven. Like, you don't have to do that. But what if you begin to confess every single day, Jesus, you are Lord of my life today. I acted like a moron yesterday, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start today with you being Lord. I confess you as Lord. Holy Spirit, I probably poured out yesterday. Holy Spirit, I probably splashed some sin into my cup. This sin it everywhere, but will you fill me fresh and new today? Will you, will you put me on the path of somebody that needs the very thing that you're going to pour into me right now in this moment? And furthermore, God, will you create a clean heart in me and renew a right spirit within me? Will you baptize me for the purpose of purification so that I can have a relationship with you and I can be of service to you, Jesus? What would change in your life if that's what you prayed every single morning instead of shut up, alarm clock, oh, I'm late, murk, murk, you know? Don't talk to me. It ain't had my coffee. We worship coffee more. We worship Jesus in the morning, don't we? Man, well, that question coffee is pretty good. It ain't that good, though. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Like, Guys, don't lose the power of a daily confession. And it's simple. So what have I done? In under a minute, I have re-upped my commitment to Jesus. I've confessed him as Lord. I've been refilled with the Holy Spirit. I've submitted to his leadership and guidance. I've asked the Lord to search me, purify me, to baptize me. Why? Because first, I'm purified for relationship with God. Look, Jesus paid it all to bridge the gap. But come on, church, you're created more than bridge walking. God's got a better plan for you than just for you dealing with sin. He's got a purpose for your life. 
You're a son or daughter of God. You're created for a relationship with Him. You're created to fellowship with the Son and commune with the Holy Spirit. But you can't do that if you're not holy. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Be holy, for I'm holy. Well, how, how, do we, how do we get that? Number one, it's through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. I'm the righteousness of God who through Christ Jesus. Like that's the only way that I can get to holiness. And holiness, remember, it's just a fancy word for being set apart. And if we're never setting apart God in our lives with prayer and engaging with him and worship on a daily basis, how in the world are we going to be holy? It's got to be through his blood, but it's also got to be through constant engagement in his word and in prayer. Why aren't we always harping on you reading your Bible and you praying? It's simple because that's how you're purified. Wash me with the water of your word, the Bible says. I mean, it's like, have you ever felt like, like you ever just even, even just flipped open your Bible and you see a Bible verse and you read it and you felt like somebody just doused a thousand gallons on you? It's like, holy, like, holy moly, that's exactly what I needed today. What do you think's happening in that moment? Do you think Jesus is up there going, my word? <laughs> no, he's like, yes, I'm washing you right now. I'm purifying your heart. I'm giving you a new mindset on how you're thinking about some old problems. Washing you with the power of the Holy Spirit. They're submitting to the Holy Spirit as we lead, as he leads. That's how we're made holy. Do you think that if you, are, or if you just follow your flesh, that you're going to get anywhere near holiness? <laughs> no. It's got to be making Holy Spirit-led decisions if you want to get Holy Spirit fruit. You can't do good works with dirty hands. So we allow God to purify us as he sanctifies us and prepares us for relationship and service. And let me throw one little extra caveat into this. God, a lot of times, uses people around you to help you be purified. Because they will look at you and say, brother, I love you, but you're doing this and it's not God's best for you. And our response is, you need to shut up, mind your own business. Look at your own plank, Billy. You know, like that's what we want to say. Can't talk about Billy when he's not here. You see what I'm saying, though? No, you, you love a person that is willing to have that kind of a conversation with you. They're not being a jerk to you. They love you and are trying to help you become pure. You can't do good works with dirty hands. So let me ask you, could it be that you haven't realized God's plan in your life because of a purity issue? Psalm 24 Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Wow. And furthermore, look at the product of purity in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they'll see God. Let me just lovingly ask you, if you're not seeing God, is it because of a purity issue? Man, okay, what's what's a purity issue mean? Like, you mean like looking stuff on the internet? Yeah, sure, that. But what about what about stinking thinking? You know, I wrote a I wrote that book called Killing the Orphan Spirit. And um, I put the nail on that thing and killed that thing in 2017. It was a specific moment. It was a Thursday in November. I was in Africa. Like that was the moment I felt God's love as a father for the first time. That's when I knew. I knew it was done with. But if y'all think that spirit hasn't tried to come back, (laughs) you're crazy. Like, you know, uh, he just needs a crack window, an open door. No, he just needs an unlock door and so you know what i've been trying to do in my life i've been trying to remove the door and put the wall back where it was like i don't want to just lock the door i don't want there to be a door but satan comes at me and he attacks me and he things will happen in my life like for instance when it comes to this this building situation y'all it's it's a lot of stress i'll be honest with you it's a lot of stress 
I mean, my goodness, imagine when you closed on your house. Now, th- <laughs> now think exponential, add zeros, and it's a lot, man. It's a lot. And so very easily, Satan can get me into a place where he says, see, Jason, you're all alone. And it'll come in those moments when, you know, you've just finished looking through the financials or, you know, just a, a low moment. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like you're trying to you're trying to have faith and trying to believe, you know, like trying to be up, you know. And it's like in those in those quiet, stressful moments, you'll hear this little voice that says, you're going to have to do all this by yourself, man. Why am I telling you all this? Here's why. It's because we have to stop thinking that purity just has to do with sexual morality. Responding with, I might feel alone right now. But the truth is, I have people around me that love me, that love God. They know me. They know God. They have my best interests in mind. And God has gifted them with specific talents and abilities to know exactly how to navigate the waters that I'm having to walk right now. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop thinking alone. And I'm going to start thinking like God called me to, that I'm a part of a family, that I'm not by myself. I'm never alone because God already said that I'm never alone. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And even if people do, I always have my father in heaven with me. So how can I be alone? You know what I did in that moment? I got baptized. What do you mean, dude? I allowed the water to wash over me and purify, purify thoughts that were leading me down a path of sin. Y'all follow me. We, we try to church this up too much sometimes. We try to make it too complicated. I want you to think about the thought process that you have. Could your thought processes take some purification? If that's the case, then let me ask you another question. What are you doing to purify? I suggest baptism. It might mean physical baptism for you today or sometime soon. But I'm definitely suggesting that every single day you have moments where you allow your spirit to be baptized in the word, in the power of his spirit, in the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Y'all, Jesus' baptism was a big deal. It was. It was a big moment for Jesus. It was a big moment for us, okay? And Jesus was preparing himself to sacrifice himself on that altar so that we could be restored with God. We could have our relationship righted. He made it possible for everybody to do that even now and today. Now, for him, while it was a one-time event, I'm asking for you to make it a daily event. Daily confess Jesus as Lord. Daily invite the Holy Spirit to fill you to overflowing. Daily ask the Lord to purify you and then for him to show you exactly what it means in that moment for you to do that. I'm telling you what, the Lord might direct you to your sink and have you fill your hands full of water and splash it on your face. Now, oh, that, oh preacher, well, we dunkers, we're not splashers. I don't care nothing about that. I want you to do what God's told you to do and keep it in line with the scripture. OK, that's what I want you to do. Maybe, maybe in that moment, it's just a reset. Did you know that when you take cold water and splash it in your face, your body, it triggers an endorphin release in your body that makes you like wake up and you get this burst of energy? That's why we do that. I'm just getting my pores clean. No, you're trying to wake up too. Whether you knew it or not. Maybe some of you, your spirit needs to wake up and it's just something that's letting water hit your face. Ah, that sounds weird. That sounds hokey pokey. Whatever, man. What's it gonna, what are you going to do to get you to the next step? To get you the purification that you need? You know, at the beginning of this message, I asked the question, where did baptism come from? I want to leave you with one last Bible verse today that not only explains where it comes from definitively, but also why your purity is so important. Here it is, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 26. And I will sprinkle on you pure water, and you will be clean from all your uncleanness. And I will cleanse you from all of your idols. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will give to your inner parts. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I need to talk to some of you people that are sitting here today that wonder how in the world can I be pure after what people have done to me. I need to talk to you for just a minute. Because it is not about what other people did to you. It is about what God wants to do with you right now in this moment. And if you will allow him to baptize you and purify you. Listen to me. If he heals you, you'll be healed. If he cleanses you, you'll be clean. 
So it doesn't matter about what you have done or what has been done to you. In this moment, God is calling you to a place of purity and holiness. And it's not your work. It's not what you do. He's the one that does it. You just have to submit to baptism. You just have to submit to his leadership. You just have to submit to his guidance. So what am I asking you to do today? I'm not asking you to turn a flip or jump into the water or do a cannonball. None of that. I'm asking you to submit to whatever the Holy Spirit wants to tell you right now about your purity. Some of you are sitting here today and you have not been engaged in ministry and it's a purity issue. It's not because you're engaged in some sick, immoral something, but it's because stinking thinking has kept you dirty. It's time to get clean, man. What would have happened if Jesus would have not submitted to John in baptism? No sacrifice. Why? Because Exodus already told us, if you didn't get pure, you die. What's going to die in your life if you're unwilling to submit to the process of purification right now in this moment? I'm not trying to scare you. I want you to know that God has something bigger and better than what you've been living. And if there's been immorality and impurity and uncleanness in your life, then number one, join the club. It's a big boat. But number two, you don't have to live another day like that. The Lord is calling you to purity today. For some of you, that's baptism by water. We can do that today. For some of you, it's baptism in your heart. We can do that today too. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you right now. Oh, Jesus. I'm asking you to do what only you can do in this moment right now. God, I feel the pain of the brokenness. Not just from sin that people have committed that's made them unpure. That's made them unclean. But God, I feel the pain of what others have inflicted that's brought impurity into their lives. God, abuses. And not just physical abuse, but God, words that have been spoken that have created uncleanness in their hearts. I break the power of them right now in the name of Jesus. By the word of God that washes us and cleanses us. You are the one, God, that cleans us. You are the one that sprinkles us and makes us whole. I'm asking you to do that with your people right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, everybody, if you just close your eyes for a second, I don't want anybody around the room looking. Just focus on you and the Lord right now in this moment. But if you know in here right now that your life, there's been impurity and uncleanness, and you know right now God is calling you to get baptized, whether that's real baptism or baptism in your heart, I want you to just raise your hand right now. It's not so that I can see it, but it's so that God can see it. And he's about to pour the water into your life right now in this moment. Just be willing to say, yes, uh, it's me. It's me. Baptize me, Lord. Purify me. Clean me, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to submit to John, to be baptized, Jesus. Thank you that you didn't come to cancel the law, but to fulfill the law. Thank you that you offered yourself as a sacrifice. But thank you that you became the high priest that we needed for once and for all to become sin so that we could might be the righteousness of God through you, Christ Jesus. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. Now, Father, we ask that you would wash us clean right now in this moment. God, we confess sin. Maybe you need to confess some sin today. God, we confess it and receive your forgiveness. Wash us clean, Father. We thank you for it, Jesus. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to have our team come to the front right now. I know this is a solemn moment, so I'd like to try to do our best to, to keep this a solemn moment because I feel like you might have some transactions you might need to make with the Lord right now. I, typically, I'll go out to the front and greet people. I love you guys. If you've never been here, if it's your first time, God bless you. We love you. We'll get you a goodie bag. But I'm going to be over here at this tank. And if anybody feels like God's calling them to get baptized in this moment, I'm going to be here to baptize you today. But maybe you need to come get some prayer. Maybe God did something in your heart, and all you need to do is tell somebody and have a prayer of celebration. Whatever it is, I ask that you would take the time to do that today. All right?
Thank you all so much for being here. God bless you. I love you all so much. I know this is, a, this is a heavy moment right now, and it's almost like we don't want to leave it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do what you feel like the Lord's telling you to do right now. If you just need to sit for a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to keep it soft in here. But otherwise, we love you. you will have a great week. Y'all dismissed. Here's the team if you need it. We'll be ready to baptize if you'd like to. God bless you guys.